to one, ten to one. So if we can do it at two to one, I want to build the car, and I explain that to every owner. If it's going to violate my two to one rule, I sit them down and I explain that to them right there. I've got a man right now. We're building a vehicle for him. He said, "I want to start with a hundred grand." I said, "Okay, you know that a hundred grand will not do what you're trying to do." And let me make sure you understand. When we're done, you're going to have thirty thousand dollars for the car because what you're building is weird and it's for you. And he said, "I get that. Let's build a car. I'm going to build a car." Next question. Yes, sir. Phantom Works comes from the Boeing um, in the aerospace industry. You're live, yes. by the way. Am I? I'm Facebook. Okay, we're Facebook live. Apparently, I don't even find out anymore. Audrey, just, she surprises me at the shop all the time. So, hello, folks. Um, Phantom Works came from. Uh, I worked with the Lockheed Martin. And Lockheed Martin created a, uh, an organization called the Skunk Works. Boeing then created a company called the Phantom Works. And because I worked in the aerospace, you know, R and D world for a long time. I wanted to sort of pay homage to that world, and when I asked people what they thought about the name Skunk Works, <laughs> nobody liked it. And, and yet, in reality, Skunk Works is arguably the most famous aerospace industry in the entire world, but there's not 2% of the population that understands them. I mean, they're the ones that built things like the RS-71, yes. later accidentally called the SR-71. They built all of the coolest airplanes in the world. So that's where Phantom Works came from. Favorite car I made. The very first car you oh, made. The first car. Actually, the very first car we ever built is a 1959 MGA that is British Racing Dream, and the man drives it almost every day. In um, he lives in. Uh, What's up north from us? Uh, that really Williams, narrows uh, it down. He lives up in Williamsburg. He still drives it to this day. And that's one of the things that I find interesting. If you saw that car today, you would you would say it looked like it got restored last week. I meet people who bring cars and they go, well, this got restored 10 years ago. It's time to do it again. Folks, if you're restoring a car and 10 years later, you need to restore it again. Either it was restored wrong or you're treating it wrong. Because a well-restored car should really last you most of the rest of your life. So treat these cars well. You know, they they weren't designed the last 50 years, so you have to take extra special care of them. Yes, sir. I watch the backgrounds on all these shows. Uh -huh. The tools get better. The limbs get better. So what's the deal? You get the, you get all the stuff for nothing from these. Absolutely vendors, not. So you pay for. It. I won't. I do very very little sponsor work. And the primary reason is they want your soul signed in blood, and I won't do that. I don't know if you've noticed it, but you've never seen one banger, banner hanging in my shop. Well, except when I put one out about Hillary. When she was, that's the only banner I've ever hung in my shop. Your Facebook uh, Live. Okay, I'm sorry. So, so I, you don't know, but I get. I think you can all guess which way it went. But um, that's the only banner I've ever, banner I've ever hung. So. So because I don't do a lot of sponsor stuff, I pay for all the equipment. Um, I will tell you, like, one one uh, shop that came out, and it's a fairly small company, Arclight Dynamics, they gave us a plasma table. So so we did that. But no, the lifts, all the machines, that's all bought, bought and paid for by us. I, I almost, I almost, I almost wore my Hillary for prison shirt. That was but, my banner. But, but I was afraid somebody would scratch my car, so I left it home. I had that I banner hanging up on my crowd wood, but I almost wore it. I hung yeah, it on my car. Um, They're moving cars out. Now, why would they do that now? <laughs> okay, next question. Yes, sir. I don't see Bobby. You don't see Bobby. Nope. I will just tell you the quick version of it. I put him in charge of the shop for a, for two weeks. I'll, I'll, before I tell you that, I'll tell you real quick. I hired a man who came in and he said, for $100,000 a year, I will run floor operations. Like, I won't do business development. I won't do the engineering, but I will just manage the floor. He came in after one day at the job. He said, if you think I'm going to do what this for $100,000 a year, you're crazier than hell, and he walked out. So, that's how difficult it is. 
I, I had to leave the shop for two weeks and I put Bobby in charge and it was too much. He left while I was gone. He said I can't take it. So the, the, the stress of running that building and doing the show on top of it is beyond anything I could even describe to anyone. Yeah, it's, it's horrible. It's not fun. Yeah. Yes, sir. I went by your shop about a month ago. Roll of doors up. I saw a uh, look like a, a World War II Corsair or something in there. The wings folded up. Right. Uh, are you doing work uh, restoration? From that? We are. We've got a couple um, couple old aircraft in the shop right now. We're restoring. We've actually got three pre-war airplanes in the building. So yeah. I mean, I was actually building airplanes professionally before I built cars professionally. So. There's a there's a love for things that fly. Just yeah. a deep one right yeah. there that work. Yeah, yeah. We we've got some old airplanes in there, and you know. You'll have to watch. Yeah, you'll have to. There, there you go. You'll have to watch. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. 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 Turnover is an interesting thing. Before the show came out, in six years I lost one man. One in six years. The year the show came out, I had to fire five people. <laughs> Folks, the, the television show, you know, I'm sure that there's a part of it that it looks glamorous and you think that having a TV show is kind of cool and all that. Um, I would argue that almost every single facet of it is negative. Um, it lacks your pocket though. Well, oh, you think so? <laughs> yeah. you, are, you could not be more wrong. You could not be more incorrect about hey, that. If it if, wasn't for your show, I wouldn't have been over here asking you some questions. Yeah, no, um, no. The, the show we don't make money on the show. Okay, okay. the show is not a money maker. Um, no, the show has been a very, very difficult thing to do because you know, take two guys in the shop. One is good on camera, doesn't want to be on camera. The other one isn't that good, but he wants to be on camera. Instant feuding. This guy who's good on camera. We put him on camera, and he wants a dressing room, and he wants, <laughs> you know, he wants ten thousand dollar bonuses. The 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 internal strife that kicked up when the show came in was beyond anything I could describe. It just and it it took about three years for it to settle out. It took three years before we finally got to a steady state, and and in order for it to steady out. I basically had to bring people in, and, and I've got one rule. Number one, you you don't go on camera and speak for six months because I want to know if you're there to work on cars or to be on the show. And because I made a mistake in the in the first year of the show, we we uh, interviewed a metal worker, and the guys are like, we would love to see the whole process on here. He came on, worked for about three weeks, got on one show. He said, I'm done. I got what I wanted, and he left. So that's really all he was about, was getting 15 minutes of fame. So my rules have changed. People have to prove that they're a good worker before they'll ever go on TV. Some people will never go on TV. A lot of guys you've never seen on the show. On the, uh, show. Um, the dynamics, they just, I could, I could write a complete, you know, uh, doctoral thesis on just how it affects people to have cameras come into a shop. See, we are actually just a garage, okay? And, and, and folks, I say that, and I know that you're going, well, no crap, I get that. But, but really, we're just a garage, okay? I, I do my best to keep the highest standards I can, but we make mistakes, and we have screw-ups, and cars get damaged just like at any other shop. I do my best to always try and make amends and make things as good as I can. Um, but as a result of the TV show, Customers think like there's little leprechauns that fly out of the woodwork at night and like perfect cars while we're sleeping. And people think that because we've got a TV show, we're millionaires and, this, and all the builds are sponsored and everything else. None of that is true, okay? We are just a garage building cars and working and the addition of the show just made things much, much tougher. So, so it isn't as positive as you think. Yes, sir. How often do you run into trouble very, very little in now. If you're asking industry wide, that is the most common problem of all. At my shop, about two percent. And and the reason 
I have very little of that problem as I sit down with the owner before we start and we sort of have a come to Jesus conversation and I've always done this where we talk about this. I don't, I'm, I'm not going to pump sunshine up their butts and tell them that, you know, we're going to fix your car for five grand and make it worth 50 grand more. In fact, if anything, the opposite is going to be true. We might spend 50 grand on it and make it worth five grand more. And that's just the nature of old car builds. So we have those conversations. So I'm not going to say that that never happens, but it almost never happens. Yep. Yes, sir. When are you going to pick up your own after car? <laughs> They are magnificent. I mean, if you've ever seen one up close... I've got to ride it one Oh, have you? Yes. They're, they're not beautiful. They're no. definitely not sexy. They're not fast. They handle like crap, but they're cool. <laughs> but they are just the coolest little car in the world. Yeah. 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 yeah, if you've ever seen one up close... And did you get a chance to go in the water in one? Yes. Okay, in Texas, so yeah. wasn't that an experience? Oh, it was the scariest experience of my life. It's really weird, you know, you know it floats, and I watched it float beforehand. You still get in and you're going, this is not right. Yeah, it's very weird to yeah. get in a steel car that you've just had the doors open in yes. and plummet it straight into the water because yeah. it doesn't make sense. No. But once you've been in one once, you fall in love instantly. Oh, I'd, I'd love that. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely magnificent. There's a question back there somewhere? No? Okay. Yes, yes, sir. How many employees do you have? Roughly? We tend to have about 25 full-time employees about five part-time contract employees, and then unfortunately the film crew. Who we it's, love. It's, <laughs> yes, we, no, it, we actually have a, a really good film crew. They have learned to sort of become almost an extension of the shop, but you still have to deal with them, right? I mean, things happen every day, and there's typically five to eight of them every day. So, I mean, you know, there's typically 35, 38 people in the shop at any given time. And, and quite honestly, that's about 34 to 37 more than I want. I understand. No. Yes, sir. Short, uh, the other day, on the TV, it said you had 90 cars in the shop for the store. How do you keep track of them? <laughs> the man that, that actually helped me do that the most is not here today. He only lives a few miles from here. Um, one of the things I decided to do, and by the way, it was a mistake. We got up to 97. I wanted to break 100, and at 97, I wasn't staring down the barrel of a 45. I was staring down the barrel of two. Um, and, and I decided to turn that way back, and I, I sort of throttled back to into the 70s as a rule. Um, but what we do is we track everything. Every part that is requested, every part that's ordered, every part that's a, that arrives. Every minute that a, ta a car is touched is logged into a system against that car. So if you see the show and I hand somebody a 20 or 40, or in one case, I think a 70 page invoice, and by the way, that's in size eight font. Otherwise it would be a 200, it would look like, you know, like a, a novel. Um, every single thing we do is tracked every single day, right down to the minute and to the penny. And that, that was a science that we had to get done first. We spent five years writing the software. I mean, and and that the software program alone is is almost as creative and and sort of you know well run as the shop itself. Without it, because back when we were running six and eight cars, I was trying to manage all that myself. At the end of the day, writing everything down, and I was going crazy with eight cars. And I realized at that point, you know. It was over unless we developed something a lot better. So we started writing the software back in about 2008, and it took about five years to write it. So that's not to say we don't upgrade the software. Like every month we do a software upgrade. Yes, sir. Hey, Dan, I've been in your shop before on one of the tours. Yeah. One of the things that somebody told me afterwards is that your shop and your guys have the ability to build just about any part. Let's say that you you just cannot replace it. You've yes. looked. I've seen the shows. Yes. Do you, is that true that yeah, you actually we can, can we fabricate anything? Damn near. We fabricate in steel, brass, copper, aluminum, wood, plastic, Kevlar, uh, fiberglass. Yeah, we've had to manufacture quite a few parts. We can manufacture a quarter panel if we need to. I mean, like, if, if you came in with the only car in the world like it and your quarter panel was stolen, we could build you another quarter panel. Now... Didn't say it would be cheap. 
because <laughs> you know that takes a lot of hours to do right. but yes we can manufacture just about anything we have our own foundry right <laughs> and and now we're we're into the world of the 3d like we've got some 3d um, uh, modeling and printing and we have 2d um, you know modeling right. and printing so and, that, and cutting is that also true of like cast iron parts and things like that that you would Cast, cast iron is actually particularly tricky. Um, cast iron, you have to account for a 10% shrinkage. So I have not yet attacked a cast, the manufacturing of a cast iron part. Um, I know, I understand the science of it, and I actually have all of the equipment to do it. But the danger involved in doing it, the OSHA regulations and everything would make that something you'd almost say is a bridge too far. If I have to, I haven't had to yet, I'll see what happens the day I have to. If somebody's, if somebody's pockets are deep enough that they want that, I could do that. Yeah. How uh, difficult is it for you to find good fabricators along those same lines? How many have you gone through? Finding them is incredibly tough. Keeping them is even tougher. See, folks, I get sniped. Okay. And let me explain again. Remember I said we were just a shop? You have to understand, we're just a shop, okay? We And our rates, look, I know what your rates are up here at car shops, and our rates are about half those. Our rates are not high. We're average about $75 an hour. Well, if you start doing the <laughs> math on that, that means that our average tech is making about $20 an hour. That's not a lot of money. So what happens is, I've, we've now got 90 million viewers on the Velo Velocity, has 90 million um, uh, viewers and we have about the same overseas. So you don't think in 100 and 180 million viewers, someone out there sees a fabricator or someone they want and doesn't approach them on Facebook and offer them another five or ten dollars an hour happens to me all day long. I fight that more than you can imagine. I mean, I really do. I fight it hard. Um, so I get sniped regularly. I listened hard at the end of the shows to try to figure out your hour hourly rate. You know, when you start talking it's about numbers, 75, you know what I came up with? What's that? $75 an hour. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> that's about what, 75 that's bucks what an I hour. Came up with. And, and, and folks, my overhead is 45. My my employee has salary, average salary is about 20. By the time you add taxes, you're up to about 25, 26. Insurance. So, no, well, that overhead includes yeah. that. But so, that on a really good project, we make 3%. Somewhere in three percent range. That's, that's why, on a really good project. That's why you need ninety cars? Yep. That's that's exactly why we had to run a database and run that many cars is in order to keep the overhead down. You know, each tech averages having three cars in the shop, and that's done for logistics reasons. A tech will work on car A until he runs into part stoppage, and then he'll place the order for those parts and get on part B. and And our average part lead time is about three weeks. Because, you know, you take, we're building one car right now, a single part. I'm on my seven-month wait for that part to be finished. So, seven months, what are you going to do with a car while you're waiting seven months for it, right? I think you got 55,000 square feet. Right. That's and, and that all plays into that, right? That's why I need the square footage, why each tech has three cars, why we run the management system we do. Because if you don't do it, you can't possibly keep up. Um, for those of you who have seen the show Restoration Garage in Canada, they build three to eight cars a year. That's why they, you know, they can't possibly turn out 20 shows with two cars per show. You realize building 40 cars per season requires about 80,000 man hours of labor to do. That's just, I mean, it's a sick amount of hours to do and it's a really sick number of hours to manage. So, so that's what makes it tough. Yeah. Well, first off, thank you for your service. Thank you. I'm retired also. Yeah. How many times during your 24 years, I believe, you had in the military yep. that you had to give away your passion for business and deploy? Or, I know there was a lot for us. We, were, we had cars and we had to sell. Because I've only seen, I'm, I'm one of those guys that, that didn't do that. Um, my last move to Savannah, or my, my last military move, um, from Savannah, they said the average military move is 4,500 pounds, and I was at 29,000 at the time. So I was paying a lot of money, you know, because the military, um, at the time I was at 04, 
and I think they moved 10 or 11,000 pounds, so almost 20,000 pounds was on me to move. So, you know, I'm hiring my own Atlas, you know, moving truck and moving me. So, I was, I was dumb enough to try and hang on to almost everything. Some people would call me a hoarder. Yes. <laughs> but, but I'm a hoarder. If you come to the shop, you'll see what I hoard. It is Everything. 1920s porcelain signs and gas pumps and, and neon and old cars and tools and stuff like that. Not exactly garbage. At least it isn't garbage to me. Now to Audrey, you know. Why do we need the glass eyes? Why do you need glass eyes? Why? Why glass do we need a cool. Mickey Mouse bowling ball with no holes? Well, because it was an undrilled Mickey Mouse bowling ball. I mean, that was just cool. How many times have you ever seen one, right? No, I, I, I found a man who had a glass eye collection. I was out looking for one. Because if you've ever seen glass eyes, they're just, I mean, the detail in them. And they're all hand done. We're talking about 1800s glass eyes. Well, she wasn't I that bothered by it until she found out they were reclaimed. Oh. <laughs> I don't want to get into any more detail than that. You tell oh. someone when you order something like that. Yeah. That way they know what they're opening. I thought that that just made it cool. From an <laughs> no, no, no. They went beyond that point. No. Oh. Oh, yeah. These were underground. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. How involved were you in the interview to determine what ends up on the air? I am, I would be considered what you'd call like a technical editor. So what I do is I watch the show because I know that you know, this process had to happen before that. And you have to understand, our shows average 18 months in production. So in 18 months, lots of stuff gets confused, right? I mean, 18 months where you figure about every other week, you know, film content is being shipped to an off-site location, and some poor bastard of an editor is sitting there looking at, you know, all these different things and trying to make a story out of it. So. What I do is when they piece together what they think kind of makes a story, then I come in and I make sure that they haven't put, like, you know, C before B, or, you know what I mean? And, and so I do take a fairly heavy role in that. I don't edit it, like, I'm not sitting there saying color correct this or do that, but I make sure that the build is how the build went and that things are in the correct linear sequence. I, that is my role. Yes, sir. Well, my favorite car, I think we're being kicked out again. Um, my favorite car is a 63 Corvette split window coupe. Just hard to beat, you know, what Bill Mitchell, um, and I think even Harley Earl had a, a little bit of a role in it, but mostly Bill Mitchell. Um, and, and the one that is my favorite and what made it my favorite was that we had just finished a fairly, like it wasn't the build I wanted to do on it. I did a build for a man. And the week after I finished it, he came back and said, if you give me some of the money back, I paid you for the car, I'll give you the car. Because he was going to prison. <laughs> I said, you have a deal. So I, I got a 63 split window for free. Oh. And that's a pretty good deal. Airplane? I mean, the most beautiful airplane in the world is a Spitfire. That's the one. In fact, I'm, I've, I've got my eye on one in England that surfaced fairly recently that hasn't been restored yet. It's an original Warbird, too. You realize most of the Warbirds were never in war. I, I, in doing a lot of research on, on doing old airplanes, Almost all of the wartime aircraft, the Mustangs, the Lightnings, the Spitfires, the Hurricanes that you see in museums were all built after the war because almost everything in the war was destroyed. Probably only one in 50 survived. So to find an actual warbird is pretty cool. So I've, I've got my eye on one, but they're not exactly cheap. A propeller for a Spitfire is 100 grand. You got like 10 more minutes. Well, you okay. can fabricate it. No, you can't fabricate it? No. A you propeller is not something... You could fabricate anything. You could, no, I, but it wouldn't be uh, FAA. Um, right, right. That has to be FAA certified. Yeah, and I'm sorry, the FAA is not going to certify me on a propeller. <laughs> Does that have the Merlin? It did. Um, probably the most beautiful engine ever built. You know, uh, just amazing. And, of course, they were built by Rolls-Royce, taken over by Packard. 
Packard built most of them. I think even some of the ones that went back to England to go into uh, the spits and the hurricane. There was a question by the guy behind yeah. you. That, I, I'm going to give you a very sarcastic answer to that, oh but it really all depends on the attitude of the customer. Mm -hmm. um, He's got a great attitude. <laughs> <laughs> if, if a customer understands that it is what it is and we have to do what we have to do, then there's a real good chance the opening is right around the corner. If the customer doesn't understand it, I've got more than 2,000 people on a list, most of which don't understand anything, and I have to write them and say, I'm sorry, I'm probably not your builder. So, so really, it depends on, well, some of it depends on the car, but mostly it depends on the customer. Anything else? Yes, sir. You know, when you said that 63 split window, that reminds me, you yeah. all built that tail on that. We pepper. did. Tell me about that. And are you going to make those things available? Did you do all that in-house? We, we did all that in-house. In fact, I got my patent on that last week. All my, right, because that's my, cool. We, we applied Glad. for that patent about five years ago, and it arrived last week. Man, so, um, yes, we are building those. Alright everybody, that concludes our Facebook Live at the NRA show. Uh, we're about to sign some autographs, take some more pictures. Uh, hopefully we will see y'all soon. Bye!